Hello guys, welcome to a new video. I am back from my trip. We're gonna now react to the French Revolution Oversimplified Part 2. So this should be interesting. King Louis and his family were now in the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where for the next couple of years, he watched as a revolutionary government began to strip away his power. And fearing for his safety, he had to stay on their good side. Hey, look who it is. Yeah, because the alternative was literally getting murdered. He lost his military and he lost his citizens. Once you lose those two, there's nothing else you can do. It's my favorite revolutionaries. Yep, I'm your number one fan. What can I do for you? Hey, King Louis, so we've made a few decisions. First, all of your friends in the nobility are gonna have to pay taxes the same as everyone else. Great idea. I love it. And as a side note, the tax money can no longer pay for all your lavish parties. Great. I hate those parties. They're so awkward. And also, we're taking away your Porsche. Oh, come on! That's true. They were taking a lot of his powers. Obviously not the Porsche, but they did take away a lot of his money and wealth. How I see it, if I were to be analytical of the whole revolution, they were very envious of the rich, right? Even if they did earn the money on their own, right? They still would be very envious and steal that. One of the big things they would also invade is also the, the church, which is a very sad thing that happened. They would invade the churches and steal the money from them, even though the churches actually helped out the poor. That makes no sense. But for the king, I, I don't know. I mean, yay. The king continually found demand after demand being made of him to prove his support for the revolution. On one occasion, a mob would invade the palace and demand he wear the revolutionary bonnet. This is the face of a man who is definitely pretending he wants to wear that bonnet. Seeing the situation rapidly turning against him, the king decided it might be a good idea to leave France and mount a campaign to retake his country from abroad. Luckily for him, he was married to an Austrian. So on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king and his family disguised themselves as servants and attempted to flee to the Austrian Netherlands. The royal carriage made a stop in the town of Varenne, and the postmaster there was like, hey guys, what's up? Where are you off to? We are but a collection of inconspicuous servants heading for the border for no particular reason at all. Say, you, the fat one, you look kind of familiar, aren't you the- Was he really that fat? I wonder. Tell me in the comments, how much did he actually weigh? The king? Nope. Let me see your passport. It says here you're King Louis the Sixteenth. Nope, not me. Take him away, boys. The king was promptly returned to Paris. But now, the jig was up. His lack of support for the revolution was clear to all, and many considered him a straight-up traitor who tried to abandon his people. As a result, the new constitution- Bro, they didn't even want him. And then when he's just leaving, right? Oh, now it's a problem. You can't appease the people. You will never appease these people, the angry mobs, because they're too emotional, right? They don't care about logic. He, he was gonna leave- they didn't even know that he would come back and try and evade him as the plan he wanted. So, well, <laughs> there was no real problem. They should have just, like, left him, right? That would have made more sense. ...of 1791 completely reduced his powers to that of a simple figurehead, a constitutional monarch. However, radicals, such as those in the Jacobin... I do think constitutional monarchies are good, but to be fair, like, they don't really have much power. The monarch is more like a symbol, right? Kind of uplifting the people and keeping them in check that, that's kind of why i notice keeping everything in check and kind of creating a symbol to people like i said before but they should have a little more power right i feel like constitutional monarchies are not enough in my opinion i think the monarch needs to have power over uh, the state a lot more right that's kind of just my take on it you can have whatever opinion you want but yeah i just feel like we should be fair, because the monarch is really important. ...club were outraged that the king wasn't to be removed entirely. So a month later, these radicals staged a protest on the Champ du Mars, calling for the king's removal. The government of Paris feared an insurrection was mounting. This is what I feel like is the, the bad part of the Western world. They shaped the entire West. And it was just a bunch of angry people that did awful things, chopping off heads and, you know, doing such barbaric stuff. The idea of the Western civilization that we know today is not based off 
of this, but this is the negative effects. You get this. Don't we see this today? Don't we see this with social media? We have groups, mobs of people that have no logic and just attack everybody. Canceling people, for example. This is just cancel culture. In 1800, well, it's like 1790 or something like that. But you, you, you get what I mean. This is not new for what we have today. It goes all the way back to this. And even in the 1960s America, where there was the Red Scare, everyone was canceling each other. And they sent the military to disperse the crowd. The confrontation escalated and resulted in the Revolutionary National Guard firing on a crowd of revolutionaries. It was a massacre. The incident exposed a deep division within the Brotherhood of the Revolution. On one side, the moderates who wanted to keep the king as a figurehead. On the other, radicals who wanted to see the king deposed and heads roll. In the wake of the massacre, these radicals received a wave of support. And speaking of rolling heads, one form of equality the revolution introduced was equality in execution. This meant no more torturous drawing and quartering, no more inhumane hanging. They wanted all criminals, regardless of economic status, to receive the same penalty, a quick and painless one. Luckily, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Guillotine had an idea. A heavy blade that falls like thunder. That Called the guillotine. The head flies off, blood spurts, and the man is no more. The guillotine, otherwise known as the National Razor. Fun fact I learned from VTH, you can check his channel, Vlogging Through History. Another thing I learned from him when he reacted to the video was apparently when you have your head cut off, you still have conscious thought for like a few more seconds or something like that. That's kind of creepy. Imagine moving around being headless for your last five seconds. Like, I don't know. The guillotine made its debut in 1791 as the new form of execution. The writings of Marat and others continued to call for the execution of anyone suspected of working against the revolution. For him, this included some members of the clergy and nobility who had previously benefited from the cruel system of inequality that existed before the revolution. In many parts of the countryside, local lords had found themselves become a target. Sire, the peasants, they're revolting. Oh, come on, that's a bit harsh. Sure, they smell a bit, but I wouldn't say they're revolting. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Increasingly, these French aristocrats began fleeing France to find solitude in other parts of Europe. And once again, fear began to take hold. The privileged classes of these foreign nations didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own lands. The National Assembly... What did he say? And fear began to take hold. The privileged classes of these foreign nations did... The privileged classes. I don't know if there was much privilege back then. You know, I, I, I think I get what he means, but I don't think privilege is the right word for this. They had access to a lot of resources, but I don't think they were the most privileged. Didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own lands. The National Assembly, actually now the Legislative Assembly, feared that these nations may decide to attack. Then why don't we attack them first? No, you idiots. We are definitely not ready for war yet. Did somebody say something? France declared war in Austria in April 1792 and immediately got pummeled. It also didn't help that Austria's ally, Prussia, joined in the fighting. The Prussian Duke of Brunswick posted a letter warning the revolutionaries that if anything happened to the king, he would burn Paris to the ground. The Duke's letter proved to be a massive success in inspiring the people of Paris to do the exact opposite of what he intended. They were enraged by the threat, and on the 10th of August, 1792, the tension in the city exploded, and a mob stormed the king's palace. Fighting broke out between the revolutionaries and the king's Swiss guard, with casualties in the hundreds. King Louis fled and took refuge in the chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where Robespierre and his radical Jacobins were gaining ever more power. Given the developing situation, the chamber decided to hold a vote, and in what some considered to be a second revolution, it was decided I see the detail, like, look, so it's matching up to singing forever, all that, except that one guy, that one guy, because Decided by one to vote. suspend the monarchy entirely. King Louis XVI was now just plain old Louis, and he was sent to a prison cell where an eye could be kept on him. A month later, the newly established National Convention officially declared the French Republic, and society underwent a massive change. Enlightened ideas of democracy and equality were being implemented, but very quickly, these ideas seemed to become secondary to fear, 
paranoia, and a thirst for blood. The New Republic began working to violently remove any semblance of the old royalist regime. The church became a prime target. Priests who refused to take an oath to the revolution were deported or arrested. A new state-sponsored atheistic religion named the Cult of Reason was created as a... That's just disgusting, honestly. Like, that's probably the worst part we see in all of French history, you know? Or at least one of the worst. You know, taking out the churches, you know, um, sacking them, stealing their money, taking them out. Sometimes even burning churches, you know, like, and replacing them with paganism. It's just disgusting what they've done. Really sad. The replacement for the Catholic Church, Notre Dame, along with many other churches. Listen, we know the Catholics aren't perfect. You know, I'm not even a Catholic. I'm a different type of Christianity, but like, bro, the Catholics weren't that evil where you replaced them with paganism. If I had to choose like which one I would give my money to or I would help out, it would be Catholics 100%, even though they do like a lot of the time kind of suck. ...had their religious treasures destroyed and were converted to temples of reason. Even the Christian calendar didn't survive, as a brand new revolutionary calendar was soon introduced. Hey honey, I'm home. Yeah, whatever, jerk. Whoa, what's wrong with you? You forgot. Forgot what? Everything! This entire year! My birthday was on the 3rd of Germinal, our anniversary was the 12th of Thermidor, and you promised that in Freimere we'd go on a romantic weekend trip to Venice. No, I said we'd do that in December. December hasn't been a thing for years. The government of Paris. I'm pretty sure the origin of those dates, you know, like January, February, was like in Rome. So I thought that was interesting. Paris, now under the control of the radical Saint Culotte, began rounding up suspected enemies of the revolution and sending them to prison in the thousands. Naturally, a large number of those arrested were members of the clergy and aristocracy. As France's foreign enemies continued to close in, panic spread. Georges Danton made impassioned calls for men to defend the Republic, and tens of thousands of troops left Paris for the front lines. However, in their absence, Paris was left to its own devices. As enemy troops arrived in Verdun, the people of Paris feared that their crowded prisons were becoming a breeding ground for counter-revolutionary conspiracy. What would happen if the Prussians reached Paris and freed the aristocrats? Marat believed he knew what would happen. The aristocrats would enact their vengeance on the people. Fearing those they had already imprisoned, mobs descended on Paris's prison. I wonder what would happen in history if the French Revolution failed, if they were all destroyed during that battle and they like took Paris and all that stuff happened. Imagine how the world would change. Crazy to think about. They broke in and during the brutal September massacres, aristocrats, priests, and others were tried and executed on the spot. Even women and children weren't spared. With over 1,600 victims, even women and ch children. Hear that, just hear that. That is so sad. Even the women and children were murdered. Like. Murdering the men is one thing, right? But to kill innocent women and children, that, that's like really, really disgusting. You see what I mean? It's just awful what they've done. It's just awful. Why? See, like, this is just the how terrible it can truly get for the Western civilization. This is what we can end up with if we continue to be in this mess. We will become the French Revolution. Weren't spared. With over 1,600 victims, Word of the massacre spread across Europe. One British newspaper wondered, are these the rights of man? Is this the liberty of human nature? But there was still one man in particular that Robespierre and his radicals really wanted to see executed. You're making democracy look bad. At least they're not really a democracy. I think it was like, it, they were a republic or a democracy because democracy is, it depends on the majority of the people voting. So it's very direct. And then the republic is you vote for someone and they become like a representative. And then you get like a group of representatives and they like, I think pick up a leader or they like, there is a leader already there and they team up with them. That's kind of why I think is Republic or Constitutional Republic. That's us in the United States. So yeah, I, I don't know what they were, but either way, liberty and freedom, like you're making that stuff look bad to people. You're making a lot of people just not want that. You're making monarchs not want to give those rights because they're afraid that they'll just be murdered. <laughs> There's a peaceful way of sorting out that uh, liberty, right? Like, not every monarch is going to be always going to, uh, you know, hardcore dictatorship kind of route. They weren't even dictators. A lot of them probably would want less control because 
they were already dealing with so much. If the pressure was way too much for them, they would just give uh, more power to other groups. You know, not all of them were greedy and horrible, as we have painted them out to be. Austria and Prussia pledged that after they defeated France, they'd return King Louis to the throne. Well, checkmate Austria and Prussia, because you can't return a man to the throne if he's already dead. Citizen Louis Capet was put on trial for treason. Obviously, he was found guilty, but his punishment was less certain. Many moderates wanted to simply deport him, but Robespierre insisted the revolution could only live if the king was dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced. You see what I mean? That thing from before. Let's look back. See? See this dude? That's an interesting detail because that one added would give them that extra point. Or at least, I don't know like what his intent was, but if that was like his intent, then I think I caught it. The king was dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced to the guillotine. If you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words first. Gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am acute. Wait, you're too loud. They can't hear me. Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Wait, dude. Not cool. Uncool. Oh, that was uncool, not not cool. In her prison cell, Marie Antoinette heard the guns fire, signaling her husband's death. Before long, she would meet the same fate. Back on the war front, France defied all expectations and actually managed to push the enemy back. But yeah, but at that time, Napoleon was leading. They, they didn't even do anything. It was all Napoleon. Then more countries joined the coalition against France, and it all went to pot again. What do we do? Conscript the masses. The National Convention introduced a conscription law, with each regional department having to meet a certain quota of men for the army. However, not everyone was happy with this new law. You see, while Paris was definitely a hotbed for radical revolutionary fervor, some of the regions outside of Paris weren't quite so keen on the revolution. Some were largely still conservative, still supported the church, and just didn't suffer from that much inequality before the revolution. So as the revolution turned increasingly violent and anti-Christian... It depends all on perspective, right? And a lot of it depended on where you live. They didn't consider the other people that were there. They could have done it in many, many like other ways. They didn't have to do it in such a violent and vow awful way. I would love it if Love Adir actually reacted to the the French Revolution, like talked about it, you know, used it for a video, because it's very interesting what happened. This is the negative side of liberty, right? You get people that want to do whatever they want, and then they'll get you know insane power, right? When you get the freedom to do whatever you want. That's basically the same thing as giving a monarch the ability to do whatever he wants. That's just corrupting people. It's just corruption all over again. Many were outraged. Now they were being conscripted to fight for the new republic they hated. That was the last straw. Counter-revolutionary uprisings erupted in a number of regions across France. Some would last for years, such as in the Northwest, where a large-scale uprising was led by the Owls. Why were they called the Owls? Because their leader was named Jean Owl. Why was he called Jean Owl? Possibly because he could do a really good impression of an owl. Really? That's what we're going with? Owls? Just because this guy can do an impression of one? Hit him with it, Jean. Hoot hoot. Hoot hoot. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. The Chouannerie uprising lasted all the way until 1800. In the summer of 1793, the southern city of Toulon invited the British Navy over for some tea and crumpets, and then they asked if they'd possibly like to stay and occupy the city. Being an important naval base, this was a heavy blow to the Republic, who sent a relatively unknown young captain by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte to Let's go, Napoleon! To help stage the siege of the city. Toulon was recaptured by France in the winter, and for his service, yeah. Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The most infamous counter-revolution, however, occurred in the Vendée region. Throughout 1793, revolutionary forces clashed with the region's Catholic and Royal Army. The Republic defeated the counter-revolution through cruel pacification. In particular, General Jean-Baptiste Carrier committed brutal atrocities. In one instance, he had thousands of civilians, priests, women, and children tied to ships, which were then sunk. See what I mean? Every country has done such evil in their past. Every country has done a lot of horrible things. You know, no no country is safe. You know, I think France actually is worse than America in their history. Because, like, like 
all the French history, you know? France has a lot of beautiful things, but they've had a history, especially with the revolution. Like, that was probably the darkest thing the French have ever done. The most evil thing ever. Carrier would later be found guilty of war crimes and executed. Back in Paris, the government was still dominated by moderates. With the war going badly, revolts in the provinces, and the economy getting worse, it seemed the government just wasn't doing a very good job. Radicals' fear for the safety of the revolution intensified, and Marat even began calling for the moderates in the government to be executed. In return, the moderates called for the arrest of Marat. This led to a chain of events with the two sides in heated conflict. Robespierre declared the Jacobins to be an insurrection and called on the people to arm themselves. It all ended on the 31st of May, 1793, with the National Convention surrounded by radical sans culotte and 29 moderate Girondin politicians. Once radicals get into power, it's all over. Arrested. From this moment on, the moderates ceased to be a political force. Robespierre and his radicals would be in almost total control of the government. And this brings us to the story of a woman named Charlotte Corday. Charlotte lived in the northwest city of Caen, and like many in the area, was horrified at the rapid radicalization and increasing violence of the revolution. And the man she blamed more than anyone was Jean-Paul Marat. She wanted to bring peace back to France, and so she did something drastic. She traveled to Paris and told Marat she had a list of enemies for him to publish in his paper. Marat eagerly invited her in for a meeting. So where's that list of enemies you promised me? Here it is. Wait a minute. This isn't a list of enemies. It just says, Yippie Kaye, mother. <laughs> and just like that, Marat was no more. Yeah. So I, I find that pretty interesting. Also, so this is what he was on. Doesn't look like a toilet. Or, sorry, not to Doesn't look like a bathtub. Maybe something's like on it. I don't know. This looks kind of flat. So it looks like he's on some type of. Bed, but there's a board here. I can see the tub. So he was stuck to a bathtub. That's so weird. Honestly, like, what? Charlotte was quickly arrested and sent to the guillotine. Her dream of restoring peace, however, died with her. Marat became a martyr. In Temples of Reason, symbols of the dead Marat became the new crucifix. In death, he became an even more powerful inspiration for the extreme levels of violence that were about to rip throughout the new republic. That's right, here comes the reign of terror. If you thought this revolution already sounds pretty violent, well you ain't seen nothing yet, son. The radicals were now in control, and they believed not only was France surrounded by foreign enemies, but that within the masses, there were also plenty of internal ones too. Individuals not loyal to the revolution, conspiring to bring about its downfall. Robespierre and the rest of the radical faction were having none of it. A new committee of public safety was established with 12 members. Its purpose was to protect the new French Republic from its enemies, and it basically became a 12-man dictatorship with Robespierre as its leading voice. The Revolutionary Tribunal was also reinstated. A special court created to streamline the process of trying suspected enemies and hand- Oh, that one guy. Everyone else is guilty. Bro, like, since you couldn't really prove it, the idea was you're guilty till proven innocent and not innocent till proven guilty. <laughs> Just so dumb, bruh. Sending out their death sentences. With these two new institutions, Robespierre wanted to scare France's enemies straight. In September 1793, it was announced that terror would be the order of the day. In other words, fear had become official government policy. And from then onwards, we enter into the period known as the Reign of Terror. Spies and secret police were everywhere, and watched the people- How was everything before not part of the Reign of Terror? How bad will this get? Closely, France's public had to be extremely careful what they said and how they behaved. Obviously, criticizing this new system, or the government, would quickly have you sent off to the guillotine. But that's not all. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Any criticism from people, right? Anytime they didn't like the government, they were killed. Bro, like, they have now became stronger than the monarch himself. They've been giving themselves much more power than the monarch could possibly imagine. Hypocrites. Like, this is so ironic. When you give radicals power, and these radicals are all, you know, anti-government, they're more libertarian, they're all about liberty and freedom, and then they get power, they're no longer going to be libertarian. Like, bruh. Even the most minor offense could have you tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. 
Hello, Citizen Martin. Hello, Monsieur Dubois. Monsieur? Did I just hear you say Monsieur? That's the old style of address, my friend. To the guillotine! You know what? I didn't like him, but I do feel kind of bad for the king and his family. Oof, expressing sympathy for the royal family, are we? To the guillotine! Twelve sous for a loaf of bread? That's way overpriced. To the guillotine! Man, this bread line is taking forever. To the guillotine! And you? You look like you're thinking anti-revolutionary thoughts. To the guillotine. I'm not joking you. That stuff actually happened. Maybe, maybe the last two. I'm not sure. But that definitely still happened where people, anytime someone complained, they would just get their head chopped off. Even people who like thought about it and it made it look like they might have, they didn't care about, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. They would do it anyway, right? They would, they would chop off that book if the book said something they don't like. You know, they're not gonna read. Max, we're sending way too many people to the guillotine. To the guillotine! Chop, 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 chop. I believe it was an estimate around 40,000 people got their heads chopped off during this whole thing. And the population of France was at maybe like 40 or 50 million at the time. It was insane. All across France, about 40,000 people were killed for suspected crimes yep. against liberty. Let's say your neighbor won't stop mowing the lawn at 7 in the morning. Well, then all you gotta do is tell the government they've been talking smack about the revolution. And there's a good chance they'll end up in front of the Revolutionary Tribunal. Maybe they'll even be executed, taking a metaphorical load off your shoulders and a literal one off theirs. The most prominent victim of the Reign of Terror was a certain Marie Antoinette, who was finally tried and found guilty of treason. Now look, Star Wars reference. In 1793, she expected she'd be brought to the guillotine in a royal carriage. Fit for a queen, all the Republic could provide for her, however, was a wooden tumbrel. At 37 years old, the most hated woman in French history met her end on the 16th of October, 1793. Robespierre had saved the revolution through terror. Internal dissent was being suppressed. The food situation was no longer quite as bad. Even the French military had got its act together again. And through Napoleon. Napoleon leads all the way. I get it, he's trying to hide Napoleon so he can talk about it in later on, you know, the next video or whatever. But, what do you mean? Napoleon did everything. France didn't do nothing. I don't care what anyone has to say. It was not France that did it. It was just Napoleon. Napoleon led the French, right? But that was all because of him. He just got some of the French men and, you know, actually did something with them. And pummeled the Allies at the Battle of Fleurus. For Danton and his followers, the time was right to try to normalize the French Republic. Hey, Robes P. So we were thinking that since things are finally going better, maybe we should rein in the terror. And while we're on it, we could possibly start taking it easier on the church and also try to end this costly war. Hmm. Nope, to the guillotine. Oh, crap. As time went on, Robes Pierce. They're even killing the radicals. <laughs> They're even killing the radicals. What? I don't even think our left and right radicals in America would ever do that to their other radical people. Seemed to go, for lack of a better term, a bit mental. He was hell-bent on creating what he called a republic of virtue. And he thought he was a god. Pride. Pride comes before the fall. And for him, this meant amping up the bloodshed even more. Throughout the spring and summer of 1794, executions reached an unprecedented level during a period known as the Great Terror. Even those closest to him found their way to the guillotine if they dared oppose his ideas and actions, and he began alienating himself from the rest of the convention. He created a new deistic religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, along with the new annual Festival of the Supreme Being. Man, I think Robespierre is really starting to lose it. He thinks he's a god or something. Nonsense. Sure, he's gone a little extreme, but he doesn't think he's a god. My children, bathe your immortal souls in the virtue of my republic. Okay, yeah, he's completely lost it. Robespierre's ultimate mistake, however, came on July 26th, when he made a speech to the National Convention, in which he said this, I have in my hand a brand new list of enemies to be sent to the guillotine, and many of you are on this list, but I'm not going to tell you who yet. What do you think of that? Ah, uh, just kill him. I think we should send Robespierre to the guillotine first. All in favor? <laughs> he got himself in this situation. He came from being... Treated like God, right? He was gonna lead the revolution, but just going too far, getting his head chopped off. See what I mean? Don't go too extreme. Don't join an extreme. You know, it's, a, it's just so stupid. It's stupid. Oh, no. Two days later, Robespierre became the final victim. 
of the monstrous terror and paranoia he had created. Many historical accounts of the revolution end here with the death of Robespierre and his terror. But the revolution officially continued for another five years until 1799. So what happened between now and then? Well, after the fall of Robespierre, a more moderate political group called the Thermidorians took control of the convention. They wanted to restore stability to the government. Now, Robespierre's allies and other radicals who had fueled the terror themselves became the target of political suppression. Yep. Goodbye, radicals. Even then, though, these people, like, no, no one in the government was that strong anyway. You know, these new Thermidorians or whatever, they're not strong either. The best person who should lead is Napoleon. W. Napoleon. Bourgeois street fighters took on the radical saint culoc in the streets during a period named the White Terror. In 1795, the Thermidorians drafted a new constitution and created a government called the Directory with the purpose of preventing power from being able to fall into the hands of a single individual again. As this new government was being established, royalists who wanted to bring the monarchy back to France saw this moment as an opportunity to strike. They staged an insurrection in Paris and battled with the National Guard in the streets. Luckily, one Napoleon Bonaparte happened to be in Paris at the time, and he took control of the situation, firing on the crowd and putting down the insurrection. From this moment on, the people of Paris would never again be able to stage a popular uprising and lost their control over the revolution. For his actions, Napoleon became a general and was sent to take control of the French armies in Italy. The new directory remained a fairly ineffective government for the remainder of the revolution. It was plagued with corruption and struggled to keep the economy afloat, and as a result, wasn't very popular. See what I mean? Even like democracy, right? Or constitutional republic, whatever. They can always be corrupted. They can always have that type of corruption and evil in their hearts. It's because they're men. Men have corruption in their hearts all the time. You just gotta find that person who will be able to say no and be able to lead you know, without having corruption in him. It's very hard to find that, but even the people who make huge mistakes, you know, for a good example, Kaiser Wilhelm, he did care about the people, and he didn't want any corruption in the government. Like, he was clearly trying to do good. He just made too many mistakes. I give respect to the people that want to make it better. Yeah, they messed up and they did a horrible job, right? But still, he gave his all on... He did have a lot of problems outside, like, he, he, I don't think he was really taught the proper ways. I don't think he was given the proper values that helped him out, and could you really blame him for everything? He also wanted a lot of peace, so he did make all the attempts to try and make things better, yet that was all rejected, which is awfully, like, it's just really sad, but I don't want to rank, uh, I don't want to keep on ranting about Kaiser Wilhelm. The point is, not the best leader, but he was uncorruptible. For the people of France, with the strict social customs of both royalist France and the Tarragon, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Men no longer removed their hats when talking to women. Different classes began intermingling, and a publication began circulating that looked a lot like a modern dating app. It was social anarchy. Outside of France, the war continued. In 1795, France took the Netherlands, where they set up a puppet state. Then they negotiated both Prussia and Spain out of the war. The British attempted to land French royalists in the west to reinforce rebellion, but that plan failed. In 1796, the French planned a three-pronged attack with the aim of marching on Vienna and knocking Austria out of the war. The two northern armies were defeated and forced to retreat. However, Napoleon in the south, with groundbreaking military strategy, won battle after battle after battle. He pushed the Austrians out of Italy and began closing in on Vienna. The Austrians freaked out and Napoleon oversaw the signing of a peace treaty. He had almost single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28. So maybe it's about time you moved out of your mom's basement. Napoleon became a famed hero among the French people, but his aspirations were still higher. He briefly went off to Egypt and discovered a bunch of gnarly Egyptian stuff, but then the British destroyed his fleet and trapped his forces. Say, Napoleon, sir, you're not going to leave us here stuck in Egypt and return to France, are you? Nonsense, my boy. I would never dream of abandoning my loyal soldiers. Wow, what's that over there? He abandoned them all. On his return to Paris, Napoleon found himself to be extremely popular and the government extremely unpopular, and he started getting some power-hungry ideas. Conveniently, a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès approached Napoleon and said, Hey man, since you're so popular, do you want to help me stage a coup? 
great idea. Let's stage a coup, and then I'll coup you. What? Napoleon, with the help of his politician brother, entered the government chamber, possibly got punched in the face, and finally his troops intimidated the council to dissolve the government and create a new constitution that basically made Napoleon a dictator. So there you have it, the French Revolution, born with the great promise of liberty and equality. The common people dared challenge an oppressive system that had existed for centuries, but before they knew it... I don't think it was that oppressive of a system. Sure, there was a lot of problems, but that was outside the monarchy. That was just life. The monarch couldn't really do too much. He can't make the weather automatically be always nice. He can't take out all the animals, right? And he also had to deal with all kinds of other things. Just saying, you can't put all the blame on, you know, this super high class. You can't put all the blame on them, and you do need them. As awful as they can be sometimes, you still need everybody. You need... You need the lower class, right? You need all those huge groups of people to work, you know, all the bad jobs. Because all those bad jobs actually do a lot. There's just so many jobs that you can't really pay them all in a good amount. Then you need that middle class to do jobs that are, you know, harder to get but are still fine wages, right? And then you need, like, that kind of higher class, that upper class, that's going to kind of help create a good route for everything, you know? They help manage, and they're going to be in really, really good jobs that will help the economy enormously. They just can't do it alone. And then finally, you need that really high amount of class, and even the monarch. Because these people, who cares if they have all that power? They still have to deal with a lot more responsibility. You know, if they mess up, they will get a lot more punishment than if you were in that small job, right? That's just kind of how I see it. We need everybody on board. That's why I think corporatism is a fine system. You can check that out more on the end screen or whatever. And yeah. They found liberty sidelined by terror, equality that possibly didn't quite hit the mark, and an absolute monarchy replaced by an absolute dictator. Napoleon began stabilizing French society. He restored the... Also, I don't think he was an absolute monarch. Like, oversimplified is just wrong in this. He wasn't an absolute monarch. He was just a monarch. Yeah, sure, the overtaxation was bad, but he didn't get to have absolute power. He still like tried to follow the church, and he tried to limit himself a lot. Like He was just very neglectful. I don't think he was as corrupted. He was just kind of an idiot. Catholic Church and got rid of that crazy calendar, among other things. But he remained ever ambitious. He was France's first consul but he slept soundly at night dreaming of being something even bigger. Napoleon's expansionist aspirations, combined with the ongoing conflict in Europe, would eventually lead the continent into a huge conflict known today as the Napoleonic Wars. So that's the end for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.